Hi, Howard. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too. Yeah. So, how are things? How are things right now? It's uh, where. Tell us a little bit about where you are and um, and uh, what 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 your role is with the Prospect Park Alliance. Maybe we could get started with that. Sure. Um, I'm actually in my home right now. If you hear a blub blub behind me, it's actually my fish tank. My fish tank. Yeah. Is it, and, um, it's your sidekick. You know, it's like my uh, sidekick. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, so I'm sorry. So yeah, so I'm the forest ecologist for right. Prospect Park. I do a lot of uh, research, monitoring, and restoration work and management inside the park. And how is that? How have you been uh, adapting with the pandemic? Obviously, uh, the park is a very busy place right now. Um, it's being used uh, to great success, I, I, I feel, by the neighborhoods. Uh, it's wonderful to have it there. But how is the Prospect Park Alliance adapted with, with COVID? And, and are you visiting the park much now? Are you able to? Uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the protocol there for you? Well, uh, the, the Prospect Park Alliance has really been fantastic um, throughout the COVID epidemic. They've really tried to um, maximize everybody's safety and be very flexible to accommodate everybody's needs. For a while back in the spring, nobody was coming into work and everybody was working from home. Mm -hmm. And then as safety conditions allowed, um, they started allowing people to come back in, um, but very carefully, you know, but managed you know very careful strict safety protocols which is still going on i myself go into the park a few days a week to do things that i need to do inside the park but i'm also able to work from home a lot mm -hmm. um, because i actually have a long commute i'm i'm in westchester and right. um so they're just very accommodating of trying to really you know do their part to uh you know Fortunately, you know, the, the curve has been, seems to be flattened. Things are doing well in New York City, yeah. New York State, and the Alliance is still taking everything very, very seriously. So, oh, of course, so I'm not surprised. And I'm all, we're all very proud of what New York City has been able to accomplish, actually, in, in that regard. And hopefully that will continue. Um, so our subject today is pollinators and uh, the ecology around that. Um, what, 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 what can we hope to learn today? What's, what can we expect to learn from you today? Well, I want to talk a little bit about pollinators and their importance. Uh, I want to talk about what pro what the Alliance does to try to uh, protect and conserve pollinators and mm -hmm. create good habitat for them. And we're going to close out by talking about how that segues into citywide conservation and what people at home who have any kind of little bit of land that they can do any kind of gardening on can do to help pollinators and have a very big impact. It's a beautiful thing. Um, those are such important aspects of, of the of the overall ecology and often get treated as pests almost by definition. Um, and I just want to remind everybody who's tuned in today, we've got a nice group. Um, if you have any questions for Howard, anything at all, uh, type them into the chat and I'll make sure that Howard gets that information and we'll get your questions answered. Um, any curiosities that you might have or suggestions for future programs as well would be interesting uh, for us to know. Um, and so Howard, I think it might be a good time to um, if you're, we can get our presentation squared away um, and start into that. And um, I'll turn off my camera. And then if there's anything that comes up uh, from the audience, or if I have a question for you, I'll turn that back on and we'll take care of it that way. Fantastic. I think Cindy's about to uh, get the presentation organized. So, and when you do visit the park, um, Howard, are you, you're taking you're, are you counting plants? Are you counting insects? What would be what would be sort of a, a day in the life of Howard in the park? I'm curious. You know, it varies. And right now, because of COVID, things are so strange that it's hard for me to say I've had typical days. But right now, what I'm what we're doing right now, which is very exciting, is we are planning for fall planting. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, we, we were very fortunate to be able to to get funding, even though thing, you know, it can be difficult. We got funding to do fall planting, and we're now in, we're now getting ready to continue restoration work now in the fall. Regardless. I don't know if you're planning to talk about this in the presentation, and so that's fine. But I'd be I'd be curious to know: is there any way you can help me understand? Um, is there a particular uh, focus of the planting this year? Or is it sort of a general thing? What what what's what sort of plants are being planted? I I suppose. Sure. 
Well, um, we generally, we have a relatively small crew and it's a big park and we are, you know, we take care of all of the wooded or wild, if you want to call it, areas of the park, which encompass a lot of habitats. Um, we try to give our attention to as much of, you know, everything that, as much as we can, and certainly when anything specific comes up, we take care of it. But one of the things that we've been focusing on is specific sites, designated areas that we're actively restoring, um, which mean, often means removing of invasive plants, um, could mean, um, erosion control, mm -hmm. um, fencing to protect areas, and then planting and seeding of native species to try to uh, enhance or recreate certain habitat types. Right. We have a number of different projects going on right now. Um, mm -hmm. One of the biggest ones uh, th during the summer, there was a very big project that went on uh, along the watercourse area in the park. Mm -hmm. This was a, uh, a project that uh, the Woodlands Youth Crew uh, did oh, wonderful. and um, really cleared out a, a big area, um, restored um, the sight lines to the stream that's going there. So it's really a beautiful area now. You can see the water. And now that the, a lot of the invasives and things have been removed, there's room to plant native things to enhance the habitat. Um, while maintaining the view. So that's going to be a very big project that we're working on. That's going to be very, it's already dramatic and it's going to be continue to be dramatic. People can see that. Um, we're continuing work on an area called North Low Water Cove. That's a project several years in the making. Great. We're doing a project um, near the Garfield um, Tot Lot Playground because there's just a tremendous amount of erosion that goes on there and it floods and it becomes a mudslide. So that would be an example of a project where there is ecological value to that, certainly, but there's also uh, there's the big human element, and a lot of that is going to be planting short, hardy plants that are going to keep the soil in place and hopefully prevent that area from flooding and, and becoming muddy. Right. And then there's a whole slew of other areas in the park, too, that some of which are new, many of which we've been working on for years, where we're going to continue our work of, um, of restoring and enhancing Sorry. habitat. Classic. Classic Ecolado. Fantastic, Howard. Well, I'm sure we'll get into some of those projects perhaps in the presentation and, and, and afterwards, but um, let, let's hear what you've got to, to share with us today. Thank you so much. Today we're going to be talking about planting for pollinators and native gardening, uh, what we do in the park and what people can do at home to uh, really conserve pollinators. Next, please. So just to get started talking a little bit about pollinators, um, we're going to talk a lot about pollinators today because of the importance of pollinators to the environment and to humans. Um, but I would also like to say that it's not really, it's not only pollinators, it's really all invertebrates. Uh, the diversity of invertebrates is by far the highest of all, of, you know, of all life on earth. And if you look at the, at the pie chart, um, you know, only really only 5% of all known animals are vertebrates. Um, everything else is an invertebrate. Um, you have mollusks, you have different types of worms, you have arthropods, which include the insects. And even within that, as you can see, insects alone make up 73% of all known animal species. So, you know, the, the reality is invertebrates really run the earth, we're just living here. Um, and they're extraordinarily important. And so we're going to talk a lot about pollinators in particular, because there are some of the things that it, it's a big topic right now, it is very important. And it's sometimes easy to talk about things we can do for pollinators. But I just want to keep in everybody's mind that really all invertebrates are extremely important. And it's, it's not just the pollinators, it's also creatures that perform other functions in the ecosystem. It's not only insects either, it's spiders, centipedes. All of these things are really part of a very uh, dramatic and complex web of life. And they make up most of, uh, most of the wildlife in the park. And I hope that people will start thinking of them as wildlife. We'll talk a little about that, but uh, if you really wanna be astounded, take a look in the plants, take a look at the insects and the spiders and get a sense of the diversity and the wonderful colors and bizarre shapes these things come in and the amazing life cycles these things go through. And uh, if you can develop an appreciation for invertebrates, you will be in a state of amazement the rest of your life. 
Um, going along with that, if you look at the other chart, you know, most plants in the world are flowering plants or angiosperm plants, about 87.7%. The remainder are things like conifers, mosses, ferns, things like that. Um, the majority of angiosperms or flowering plants are pollinated by animals, 90%, and 99% of that is pollinated by insects. So it's really extraordinary when you think about that the largest and most diverse and most successful and most important to humans group of plants in the world, the flowering plants, are mostly overwhelmingly dependent on insects for reproduction. Um, they evolve together. In fact, angiosperms appear over 100 million years ago um, during the age of dinosaurs and, as in, and they start evolve, co-evolving with insects. And we see as insect groups like bees start diversifying later, the angiosperms start diversifying and it's a symbiotic relationship that um, now they're really inseparable from each other in a lot of ways. Next please. Unfortunately, insects are in a lot of trouble. It's a very scary thing because, again, the vast majority of animal life is insects. The vast majority of plants depend on insects. Um, and that's just pollination. There's all sorts of inter sorry, ecological interactions going on, many of which we don't even know about or wouldn't even think to ask about until we discover it. And yet this incredibly important group of animals is facing difficulties that we never would have thought in any other time in human history that we might be losing insects. But if you look at the chart, there's different groups of insects that uh, documented declines, caddis flies, butterflies, beetles, bees, mayflies, dragonflies, stoneflies, true flies. Um, some of these are very dramatic declines and um, it's estimated the total global insect population has declined by 41%, which is very, very scary stuff. Next please. Why are insects declining? One thing, of course, is habitat destruction, just the you know, expansion of human habitat and destruction of natural areas. Going along with that is extreme habitat alteration. Even in areas where, you ha where everything isn't necessarily paved and you still have green, um, if it's been heavily altered by people, uh, non-native plants have either been planted or, ha or um, have gotten in on their own and you no longer have the normal native plant diversity, uh, that, is a, that is a huge loss of habitat for insects. So even if you have a, an, so even if you have a green unpaved area, depending on what's in it, 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 may not, it may not be suitable habitat for a great array of insects and we're losing a lot of space now more than ever. Another very big contributor is mass pesticide use in agriculture, lawns and gardens. We've been using uh, tremendous amounts of pesticides for many, many decades, and the pesticides do not differentiate good insects from bad insects. Um, and we are losing some very important insects like bees to pesticides. And finally, pathogens, parasites, novel predators and competitors, and climate change. Um, climate change affects the other things too, um, a lot, the spread of pests and pathogens can be affected or change as climate change occurs. Novel predators and competitors would be things like, um, there are just like there's non-native invasive plants that can cause problems, there's non-native invasive insects that can cause problems. And there are certain areas of the country, of the world, where certain species of insects that have been introduced can, act, can have a detrimental effect on native insects. And certain areas, for example, non-native ants will, um, outcompete or kill native ant species. And uh, that can be a problem as well. But the main ones I would think is really habitat destruction and the pesticides is probably the biggest things, although climate change is probably becoming more and more serious with that as well. Next, please. So invertebrates of Prospect Park. Um, on the top, we have a question mark butterfly, it's called. And on the bottom, we have an Eastern tiger swallowtail. Um, there are thousands of invertebrate species in Prospect Park. And again, I really like to think of them as wildlife and I hope people will as well. Um, so, you know, we have, we have some mammals, we've got a good diversity of birds, but we have a tremendous number of invertebrate wildlife living in our park. And 
there are, and because nobody looks closely at, well, not nobody, people are, but you know, the fact that they're compared to vertebrates, they're so understudied and until relatively recently, there wasn't a big mass understanding of how important they are. It's easy to lose sight of little things. So just as a way of an example, in 2002, which is not very long ago, a new species of centipede, uh, Nanora puffmani, was discovered in Central Park in New York City. This is, an, this is a species, in fact, the genus Nanora, is a, a, the genus itself was new, um, completely newly discovered animal in the middle of New York City. Are there new species in Prospect Park? It's possible. Um, we, uh, there's a lot of critters that um, we really haven't um, you know, surveyed for. So it's, it's very possible. Um, we do know there's at least 59 species of bees living in Prospect Park. There's at least 35 species of butterflies and moths, lepidopterans, and I can tell you right now that number is low because um, it's definitely underrepresenting moths for sure. And uh, we know of at least 21 odonates, dragonflies or damselflies living in the park. And then again, there are so many other taxa of insects that we uh, haven't estimated. We've got a lot going on in Prospect Park. Next, please. Types of pollinators. You know, when we talk about pollinators, we very often think of butterflies and bees. And uh, bees are probably the most important pollinators uh, overall. And butterflies and moths are important as well. But all the people very often don't realize is there's other insects as well that are important pollinators. Wasps, for example, uh, can be very important pollinators. Wasps usually... Um, there are some wasps that feed mostly on nectar or pollen. There are wasps that are uh, more generalist. They eat other things as well, but they do also visit flowers. And um, they can be very important pollinators. Flies can be important pollinators. There's a whole, there's a number of families of flies that um, frequent flowers. I'll, we'll see a picture in a little while of a fly of a hover fly that actually seems to be mimicking a bee in appearance, but it's, but it's a fly and, and it pollinates. And some beetles, as you can see uh, on the photo there, uh, there are beetles that serve as pollinators. Um, again, most pollinators are insects. There are some vertebrates in the world that are pollinators. Uh, hummingbirds can be pollinators. There are some tropical bats that are pollinators and bats in the American Southwest that are pollinators. Um, I think there are certain geckos there's, there's a couple of other things, but it, uh, it's mostly insects. Next, please. New York State, you know, when we think of bees, we very often think of the honeybee. And the honeybee is not actually native to North America. It is from, uh, the honeybee is from Eurasia and Africa. It was brought to the United States very, very early on. It's probably been uh, honeybees in the United States at least 500 years now. And they're very important for honey production and for um, pollinating certain crops that we've planted for sure. Um, but they've kind of garnered a little bit too much attention. They're not the only bee in town. There's over 4,000 species of native bees in North America. And there's about 416 species in New York State. And just a little smattering of native bees, uh, starting from the top left and moving across from the top is, a, is an eastern common bumblebee. Next to that is a small carpenter bee, um, differentiated from other types of another, other carpenter bees. Um, agile longhorned bee. On the bottom left is a poultry leaf cutter bee. Next to that is a pruno squash bee. And next to that is a virescent green metallic bee. And those are just a you know, small sampling of the native bees that we have in uh, New York State and New York City. Next, please. This is just a, an example. All of these photos were taken in Prospect Park. And just to, just want to show everybody a little bit. These are all areas that we have done restoration work in. And all of the flowers that you're seeing were not there prior to the restoration work that's been done. On the top, you have a monarch butterfly coming out of its cocoon, out of its chrysalis. Uh, we always like to see monarch butterflies. Below that is a dusky skipper. On the bottom, the two pictures are of wasps. The picture on the uh, top 
right, which is small, bits, which is small, unfortunately, but that's a native bee. And the thing in the middle is what I mentioned before. That's a, it's a serpid fly. It's a, I think it's a hover, it's a hover fly of some type. And if you look at the markings, it seems to be mimicking a bee, but it, it's, it's not a bee at all. It is a fly and it is a pollinator. Next, please. The important part, uh, the importance of the park to pollinators. We'll talk a little about how important Prospect Park is. It's a huge green space surrounded by urban development. And there are some others that are very important too. We have adjacent to us, but not our jurors, not us exactly, is the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, which of course is incredibly important. And close to us is Greenwood Cemetery, which is very important. Um, but if you, you know, other than these areas, you look around a map of, you know, a sky view of Brooklyn, it's a lot of, a lot of pavement. Uh, so it's just very important, obviously, as a big habitat. We have a lot of habitat. We have forest, woodland edge, meadow, wetland, and horticultural habitats as well, which we're going to talk about later. One of the most important things that's about Prospect Park is it's pretty much a pesticide-free habitat. We do not spray pesticides in the park. Um, and that's very important to insects. We, we try to... Uh, uh, conserve and promote a diversity of native plants, which is very important. We'll talk about why that's important as well. And the park uh, serves as kind of an arc and a source. I've mentioned this in, in previous presentations. It's an arc in the sense that in other areas where habitat has disappeared, um, there are you know, species and populations can persist in Prospect Park where they may have gone locally extinct elsewhere in Brooklyn. And they're also a source in that from Prospect Park, they can potentially spread out to areas that um, they were extirpated from, but maybe have now become more suitable again. People have res done restoration work, done plantings, created habitat. They can, they can expand into these areas. And they can also connect to smaller populations throughout the city uh, to pro uh, provide genetic diversity um, and, and gene flow. So it's, uh, it's actually quite important. And we're gonna talk later about this, but um, it's probably important, it's particularly important maybe as a source because uh, private community gardens, sidewalk plantings, window boxes, even vacant lots have, it's been shown that they are extremely important um, everywhere and, and particularly studies have shown in New York City, there's a surprising diversity of pollinators living in, in a very urban environment in relatively small areas. And we'll talk more about that in a bit because that's, that's important. Next, please. The important of pollinators to the park. Most species of plants are dependent on insects for pollination, sustained healthy habitats, of course. Uh, pollinators are also, a lot of things that are pollinators are, uh, they provide us with food and they are food for a lot of things as well. Pollinators, are, they're a critical food source for other creatures for predatory insects, spiders, birds. Um, it takes about 10,000 caterpillars to, to raise a nest of uh, chickadees uh, from, from uh, hatching to fledging. So these animals are really, you know, I, I've said this before, you know, you, you can't love birds and hate insects. Um, and finally, they're beautiful and fascinating, just as, uh, you know, the park itself provides aesthetic and emotional and spiritual value to human beings. It's important to be in nature. A part of that is our pollinators. I know, um, we have a red, red admiral is the uh, butterfly on the screen now. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, you know, you know think about a, a, a park with no butterflies, with no bees. Um, not a nice, not a pleasant thought. Continue. So what do we do for pollinators? How do we restore for pollinators at the Prospect Park Alliance? Um, single, one of the most important things we do is we plant native species um, of local provenance when we can. Local provenance means that the, the genetics of that population originated in or around our area. Um, that's very useful because it means that the population of that species is um, is adapted very specifically to the conditions in Prospect Park in Brooklyn. Um, we also, when we are planting, especially with pollinators in mind, 
we plant a diversity of native flowers and we are looking for a diversity of shapes, colors, bloom times, because there's a lot of pollinators out there and they're not all active at the same time of year. There are pollinators that are generalists and then there are also pollinators that are specialists on only a few plants or on one group of plants or on one type of plant. And we want to be able to accommodate the needs of all these creatures. Um, there are um, pollinators that are adapted to feed in flowers that are very tubular. There are pollinators that are adapted to feed in flowers that are very flat. So it's very important to have that diversity and it's very important to have some kind of flowering plants available to them between April and November. It's a big season when pollinators of different species are active because they're not all necessarily active at the same time. I can't hear you. Hi, Howard. Just a, a quick comment about beekeeping. It's been, uh, I'm sure you've noticed, uh, there's quite a bit, there's been a bit of a, I would not a resurgence, but a surgence of interest in uh, private beekeeping around New York City recently, uh, different organizations supporting those efforts. Um, have you have you have you seen any impact in the park as a result of that, or have you noticed more uh, varieties of honeybees traveling to the park recently, or is that something that you can observe? Um, basically, a uh, question is about whether or not there's uh, an impact from the from the from the beehives that are springing up around New York City. It's hard to specifically answer what, this, what the exact effects on Prospect Park have been in the last few years per se. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do know from, about the topic is, yeah, it's become the very popular thing. Um, and, it's a and people are therefore creating more bee habitat. There's, you know, uh, rooftop gardens, things like that are becoming uh, more important. People are actively constructing these things. And overall, that's gotta be very good for pollinators. Mm -hmm. um, honeybees, um, are very important. Honeybees, there are questions about what effects honeybees may have on native bees, um, but a lot of the honeybee organizations are aware of this and are very concerned about native bees, and they are taking that very seriously. And so they are not, while they are, you know, uh, promoting keeping honeybee hives and so forth, they are also, uh, many of them are very active and very serious about native bees as well and making sure that habitat and food sources are being created for not just honeybees, for native bees. And, do. and I think any place that a garden is springing up where there wasn't one before certainly is good, good for thing, yeah. pollinators. Do, forgive me, I, I'm, I, I'm just realizing I'm a little bit ignorant about non-honeybees. Do they produce a food source like honeybees in a hive or is there another process uh that, you know whereby they store food for 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 their winter and, and it varies um a lot of bees some other some other bees produce honey but they don't produce honey in an amount that would be viable for humans to collect bumblebees produce honey but they produce a tiny little ball of honey that's mm. not viable commercially in any way and the thing to remember about a lot of the native bees is you know when we think of bees we think of honey bees we think of beehives, bee colonies. That's actually the exception rather than the rule. Most of the world's bees are not colonial hive bees. Most of them are solitary, or if they do live in groups, they live in much smaller, simpler groups. Mm -hmm. um, and most of our bees are actually solitary bees. They really live by themselves. They nest by themselves. Um, they, uh, you're not going to find them in hives. Right. Fascinating. I'm going to read more about that. <laughs> Thanks, Howie. Next, please. When we think about planting for pollinators, uh, one of the first things that comes to mind generally is planting, I guess what I would call meadow flowers. And that's a very important thing that we do in Prospect Park is that where we do have meadow habitats or open areas, we plant these kinds of flowers because they are extremely important. But there's other types of flowers that are also very important. And this is where the matter, you know, this is where planning really does come into, come into it. Um, most of the park is not open meadow. Most of the park is forested. And spring ephemerals, which are flowers that bloom for a very short time in the early spring 
and then go dormant um, really as the trees tend to leaf out um, can be very important, uh, very early food source for some of the earliest flying pollinators. In the top corner there, there's a picture of a, of a, a yellow trout lily, which is something that bees come to, but it's only, in, it's beautiful. If you're ever in the park, uh, you, there are areas where you can see them, but they're really in bloom for a few weeks, really, and uh, usually at the end of March into April. Um, but for bees flying around at that time, they're, you know, them and things like them are important. Um, woodland species are very important. Uh, again, most of the park is woodland, so, and a lot of species, and most uh, of the plants, again, are flowering plants. And flowers aren't always showy. They're not always things that we as humans necessarily notice if we don't pay attention, but it doesn't mean that the pollinators don't. So there's plenty of woodland plants that produce, some of whom produce kind of smaller flowers that are very important. In the bottom corner, that's honewort, it's called, Canadian honewort. Um, you can see the white umbels coming up from that. Yeah, it's, a, it's a common uh, native species that we have in a lot of our wooded areas and edge areas. And uh, that can be a very important uh, source of pollen and nectar to uh, woodland flying insects, especially you uh, know, Virginia jump seed, enchanter's nightshade, white wood aster. There's a whole slew of uh, woodland flowers that uh, if you look at them, you'll see the pollinators are always around them. Um, natural transitions and integrated management. Um, you know, we really are trying to create viable habitats. So, you know, where we have uh, forests, um, we're very cognizant of things like edge habitats, where forests become open areas. That, that uh, boundary is one of the most important habitats in all of nature, the edge habitats they're often called. Um, and they're one of the most important habitats anywhere in the world, anywhere in nature. They tend to support uh, creatures from both, uh, for, let's say, meadow habitat and forest habitat. And different things will use them at different times and they're very diverse. So we don't try to, you know, we try not to have abrupt changes in things, but we try to have natural um, you know, plant community um, representation as we start, you know, moving from different habitat types from, let's say, dense forest to an open area, and that promotes biodiversity. Another thing that's very important is we are really trying now for integrated management in the park, really thinking of the park as a whole, as an ecosystem as a whole, and the horticultural areas that we have in the park, um, planted areas, garden areas, often near buildings. Um, since I've been here, they've always been doing it, and they're now they're and they're still continuing to do this uh, very strongly. Um, uh, is the use of native plants even in in gardening, and our horticulture wrists? We're now we don't we we've, we've restructured. We're now all eco zone gardeners is the term because we want it to be integrated. We don't uh, have necessarily. Um, clear differentiation in the departments as far as horticulture or wild areas while we recognize the difference in management. But um, they've always been, they continue to be fantastic. And if you look at the horticultural areas of the park, they really blend well with the natural areas and they use native plants and they're beautiful. They're spectacular. You don't feel like, you know, anything's being compromised. And it really gives the park a sense of place, uh, you know, a sense of uh, continuity that really is wonderful. And they've always done a great job with that. And these areas are very important to pollinators. Um, uh, Howard, I read a question from, from Liz uh, asking about spice bush and other trees that we might, you know, consider planting if you have the option. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about trees, but I will say, yeah, trees and shrubs are extremely important as well. Uh, it's not just the herbaceous stuff. It's uh, um, trees and shrubs are some of them, many of them are hosts for the larvae of insects. They support insects different stages of their life cycles. They flower and provide nectar for insects. Um, and there are some trees and shrubs that are very, very important. And that's something that we do as well. We, we plant trees and shrubs, with, uh, you know, as well as other things with pollinators in mind as well. Um, if you have the opportunity to plant spice bush on your property, I absolutely recommend you do it. It's one of my favorite plants, actually. It's a, I think it's a spectacular plant. Wonderful. And wildlife loves it. And are there some trees that might provide pollen in a, over a, a, at a different time of season, later, earlier than some of the herbaceous stuff, which is relatively short-lived? 
Yes. In fact, we'll, I think we're gonna, it might even be the next slide, but we'll... Uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you take that away. <laughs> before we go there, I'll just mention um, the last thing, grasses and sedges. Again, kind of going with our idea of it's not only flowers in the conventional sense, um, you know, big, showy, uh, herbaceous flowers. It's also trees, it's shrubs. And things like grasses and sedges on the bottom there, the, the, the picture is, uh, it's called poverty grass or oak grass. And uh, it's not really the flowers of grasses, generally the, uh, the pollen is generally spread by wind with grasses, not so much for pollinators. But there are a number of species of butterflies that lay their eggs on poverty grass and other grasses and sedges, and it feeds their larvae. Um, it also provides a place to hide for uh, insects, and the seeds are important for birds. And um, so it's uh, it's very important to have grasses and graminoids as well, not just um, showy flowers. And the picture in the middle with the bee, incidentally, that's a uh, an eastern carpenter bee on horse mint, and that is in a er in a uh, horticultural area. That's an area that was. Uh, planted as more of an aesthetic garden type site, but they're using the native plants. It's beautiful and it attracts the pollinators as much as anywhere else would. Next. So yeah, host plants, trees, and other considerations. We think about pollinators, or we talk, we think about a lot, you know, providing nectar and pollen for them to visit. But another very big consideration is um, host species. Um, milkweed, for example, um, hosts monarch butterflies, the only um, part of plants that the larvae of monarch butterflies will eat are, are, are milkweed. Um, uh, violets and certain grasses are the host plant for skippers, for example. So we think of this as well when we're planting, not just the adults, but places for the adults to lay eggs and the, and the larvae to feed and grow. Um, trees and shrubs also provide critical habitat. Um, to get back to what you were asking before, this is the slide. That, Spring flowering trees are incredibly important. One of the, I think one of the most important sources of nectar and pollen to early flying insects is the, is the trees. And if you come into Prospect Park in the spring, it's, you know, you've, you've seen, you've, we've got red buds and cherries and um, basswood and you know, well, a huge number of, of beautifully blooming trees. And all of these things are very, very important to insects at that time of year. In fact, right. yeah. Quick, quick question. Um, Always been curious the the monarch butterfly um, milkweed relationship. Is that a is that a is that a common situation where an insect will be tied to one species like that? Um, and what what's your I'm curious on your perspective on that. It sounds like a sounds like an ecologically risky thing to to me. Or is it not? Is it is it uh, is it a strong uh, is, is, is it a strong situation or is is it a risky thing for the monarchs in that way? So it's most insects don't have one host plant, but it's not uncommon either when you have that many species. There's a lot of insects that do, or there's a lot of insects that have one genus or one family that they will lay their eggs on, or even if there's different family, you know, there, there's a finite number of, of, of species they'll use. So it, I, I wouldn't say that's the norm. It's not the norm, but it's not ridiculously unusual either. And there's a lot kind of in between a generalist and a very spe uh, host specific animal. Um, as far as an ecological strategy, um, it's great when it works. Uh, monarchs evolved with the milkweed, the compounds in the milkweed that are, the caterpillar eats the leaves and the compounds within the milkweed are assimilated into the caterpillar's body and converted into, and the chemicals are actually used to make the caterpillar unpalatable and toxic to predators. Wow. So it's a protection mechanism and it makes them very, uh, you know, susceptible to relatively very few predators compared to most caterpillars. Is, so, but the milkweed plant itself isn't considered toxic. Um, for all intents and purposes, no. I'm, I'm not sure what would happen if you ate it, um, but it's not like it's, it's not a dangerous plant to have around. Yeah, you know, interesting. Um, but um, is it a good strategy? Well, you know, 
evolution isn't really good or bad. It just is. Whatever works, works. And then when it stops working, it stops working. This relationship evolved. There's a number of species of milkweeds. So it's not just one species, but they're all milkweeds that they lay their eggs on. The monarch butterfly is a, you know, has traditionally been, it's a successful species. They have a wide range. That particular strategy works in that uh, probably a larger number of their larvae do survive to adulthood. Um, the adults are also unpalatable. Um, but then if something happens to milkweed, they're in very, they're just in very big trouble. So on one hand, it's a good strategy. It has worked. It is a good strategy. Um, for lack of, again, it's not a cognitive strategy, but, um, but on the other hand, when you're a specialist rather than a generalist, if you're a specialist, you're very good at one thing and that you can create a niche that other things don't necessarily have. The problem is when conditions change, if milkweed became extinct, Right. The monarch butterfly would become extinct as well because that's the only plant the caterpillar can live on. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you so much. So, yeah, it, it's fascinating stuff. But, uh, yeah, the trees are very important. Basswood, for example, American basswood is sometimes called bee tree. The bottom picture are flowers of the basswood. Um, bees, it's, it's, it's a spring blooming tree. Bees love it and a great variety of bees visit it. Um, just another example, hackberry and black cherry, which are two native species we have in the park, host a huge diversity of butterfly and moth larvae. I'd have to look at the numbers, but it's literally dozens and dozens of species of butterflies and moths will lay their eggs on these two trees. And for them, they're not the only trees they will use, but the number, a sheer number of species that can and do use those trees is staggering. So trees are, and shrubs are very important to pollinators. And that's something else that we keep in mind when we're planting, not just the herbaceous flowers, but the grasses, the sedges, the shrubs, the trees. Next, please. And, okay. and also it's not just providing food. So, you know, first step is we know we want to provide nectar and pollen. Second step is, yeah, but we need to provide year round food and food for um, all stages of the animal's life, including the, the larvae, which are going to be eating leaves, not drinking nectar. And then the other thing is it's not only about food. We have to provide um, shelter, places to raise their young. So uh, we mentioned before a little bit, many species of native bees, most of them are not hive bees. Um, many of them are ground nesting bees, or they nest or they chew holes and nest in, in wood or in hollow stems of plants uh, during during the winter season. And we need to provide these critical places for nesting and egg laying for these animals. So one thing that we do, you know, so when, so leaving wood in place in the forest, not just for nesting bees, but for a whole variety of wildlife is, is something that's important. You know, snags are very important ecological parts of the forest. We uh, bear so you know, bear, we don't like completely bare areas, of course, and sometimes we need to do erosion control. But it doesn't, it's not necessarily the case that a healthy system has every square inch taken up by green. Having little bits of areas between plants is very important to bees. Um, allowing for neat, you know, natural uh, ground rather than mulching. We do some mulching when we need to, but we, we try not to do too much mulching um, because that's not really good for ground nesting bees. Um, we've changed practices recently in some of the meadow habitats. We no longer we mow much later in the season to allow overwintering bees that are uh, that are uh, hibernating in the plant stalks and the in the dried grasses and the stems. Uh, make sure that they you know we're not uh, harming them. And when we cut things down, we often instead of just discarding them, we will sometimes leave them in a pile in case there's anything in it. They can still emerge, you know, from that. And uh, there are a few areas where we had in the past had solid solitary bee houses. You can you can actually make houses for bees. Um, that's not something in the park. That's just an example. But uh, on the bottom there, and um, the nice thing is that even though they are solitary, they're not uh, they're not antisocial either. Exactly, they don't live as a group. They you know each animal will have its own hole, but you can have multiple ground nesting bees living in a in, a, in close quarters as long as they all kind of have their own hole to occupy and it's a great way to boost native bee populations of, of bees that will use those houses and it's a you can buy them or you can make them next 
cities are surprisingly important for bee conservation. Um, again, one of the things is that historically, uh, there's less pesticide use in cities than in agricultural areas. So uh, we're finding that that's having a very big impact on insect populations. And relatively small patches of habitat in cities can support surprisingly high diversity and density of pollinators and other insects. Uh, New York City, New York State recently passed the Birds and Bees Act, which bans neonicotinoid, um, neonicotinoid um, pesticide for, for the next five years. That's one of the worst pesticides. It has a terrible effect on bees um, and other insects. It's, it's been used historically for pest control, but again, it does not discriminate and um, it's been implicated strongly in the, in the loss of bees in many areas. Um, 114 cities are currently recognized as bee cities by the Xerces Society, which is the Xerces Society is a wonderful organization that is, that, um, is all about uh, education and conservation of invertebrates and named after the Xerces butterfly, which tragically went extinct because not enough people knew about it or cared at the time. And that's kind of their, their flagship species, you know, emblem. But at any rate, they designate, their, you can work with them to designate your city as a bee city. Um, and there's 114 currently in the United States. New York City is home to 14% of all bee species in New York State. So we, we got, a, you know, for a little urban area, we've got a lot of bees. And research in New York City has shown that small gardens, lots, plantings, window boxes, anywhere where you can put flowers is actually extremely important for pollinators and, and for bees. And we have found that diversity and viable populations of, of some of these animals are living in, in parts of the city where you never would guess uh, because of these relatively small um, planted areas. Next. Which brings me into the idea of well, what can people do to help pollinators? And a lot of people have gardens and uh, have little areas that they can plant. And if you do, this is something that really excites me for a couple of reasons. One, it really works very well with what we're doing in Prospect Park, as I said. It really, you know, Prospect Park is a big area that can support larger populations. And, you know, by having lots of little gardens and planted areas all around it throughout the city, we're really providing corridors and expanded habitat. We can really expand the range of various pollinators throughout New York City and um, maintain genetic flow between populations. And uh, one of the things that I really love about this in particular, you know, there's a lot of environmental problems that it's very hard for us as individuals to have a big individual impact. Um, it's very important to care, to advocate, to make your vote and your dollars count. And there's a lot of things people can do. And I don't mean this in a discouraging way, but there are a lot of really big problems where, you know, truthfully, it, it is hard for an individual to see how they specifically are making a huge difference. And this is one area where you really can. If you plant your garden, your terrace, your, the vacant lot in the neighborhood, um, you'll see the bees, the butterflies, the beetles, you'll, you will see them and you will, and what you are seeing really is incredibly important conservation work. And you're having a big impact on the city and on biodiversity and on the functioning of, of healthy ecosystems, but with pollinators and plants. So um, it's a very exciting thing. And one of the most important things you can do is plant native species. Um, the natives are important because they evolved with the pollinators. They, uh, the bloom times, the colors attract certain things. The shapes are fitted to, certain, to, the, uh, to the physiology of certain insects. Um, and these relationships, which go back hundreds of thousands or millions of years, um, you know, are, are in place, work, and it's very important for pollinators to have their native species of plants that they visit for nectar or native species that we talked about before are hosts for their eggs and larvae. And if those species are gone, they can no longer, they are, they are gone. They can no longer reproduce. Um, so natives are very important. Um, and there's another aspect of this that I, that's important too, is it's not compromising. 
Um, planting native plants is not like, well, I'm doing it for the ecology, but it's not going to be a nice garden. You can have an extraordinarily beautiful garden, and there's a tremendous amount of advantages to using native plants. Um, it's actually much easier. Um, using our native plants in your garden, it, it, it makes gardening much easier and less time consuming than using non-native cultivated ornamental species, precisely because these plants are adapted to these conditions. Uh, they're adapted to the soil. They're adapted to the change of seasons. They're adapted to the insects. They're adapted to the rainfall patterns. And um, they're very hardy. And uh, there's some beautiful, beautiful native plants that you can't kill with a stick and uh, make fantastic garden plants. And as I said, they're, they're beautiful. If you, all the plants uh, on this little page here, uh, on top is uh, bee balm or wild bergamot. Below that is one of the goldenrods. And then to the left is butterfly weed, which is also an, which is a type of milkweed. It's an Asclepius. They're beautiful flowers um, that people really would love to have in their garden. Um, one thing I will caution is that a lot of the names of common, a lot of the common names of our native flowers, a lot of them end in weed. Um, and that's just, uh, you know, they've had these names for hundreds of years. They're very old, common names, and a lot of times things that there wasn't an immediate use for, um, or if it was poisonous to livestock or something like that, it just got the Appalachian, the Appalachian, sorry, Appalachian weed. And there's a whole slew of beautiful plants that are spectacular garden specimens um, that are great for natives that have that that have weed in the name, and uh, you know, uh, butterfly weed, milkweed. Jewel weed, thimble weed, Joe Pye weed, iron weed, um, and unfortunately, I think that has an impact on people. I think people hear weed and they, you know, it's you know, it's going to be weedy. It's going to not look that, and uh, it's really just an old name. A lot of these uh, native weeds are beautiful flowers that'll do great in your garden. Next, please. Just an interesting little point here. Any type of native plant you can get really is often going to be very, very good. If you can find the wild type versus the cultivar, that is ideal. And I realize as I'm saying this, it's not always easy. Uh, for, you know, it's only very recently that, you know, gardening, that, you know, native plants have really become, you know, easily accessible to private gardeners. And, you know, a lot of these are now cultivars or hybrids. The, you know, plants that have been specifically bred for certain character traits or hybrids where two species have been crossed for certain character traits. And it's actually not really easy necessarily to get wild type native plants. And that's actually an issue that we're thinking about and working on. That's a story for another time. But um, asking for it might be, you know, the first step might be people starting to demand them, starting to ask for them. But uh, if, if you can find them, uh, the wild type is often the best way to go because um, the cultivars of even of native species, the truth is this is now just starting to be studied. And I don't want to say that all the cultivars are bad for native uh, wildlife. Some of them are not. Some of them are fine. Some of them are great for the bees and the butterflies. And there's a lot of them we just don't know. But we've started to do certain people have started to do some research and we have found that in some to many cases, some of the cultivars, some of the that are being specially bred for colors that they do not occur in, in nature, sizes, bloom periods, shapes, things like the double petal, um, which are mutations um, that are being bred for human aesthetics or um, for you know, uh, human preference in, in, in ways like that. Sometimes, they're, sometimes they have effects that we're, we don't think of, like sometimes they don't produce nearly as much nectar as the wild type, or the nectar's not as nutritious, or if it's a sterile hybrid, it does not produce pollen, or the shape, or we've changed the shape of the flower and now the bees can't get into it, or we've changed the color of the flower and now some of the pollinators are not recognizing that as their target flower. So we have found uh, there are some problems with it, at least sometimes. Um, next, please. Just one example. And this was a study that was done by Ann White from the University of Vermont in 2016. Um, again, this is not the case for every uh, cultivar necessarily, but 
they, she found that, uh, you know, well, as the question says, you know, are the blue wild type on the left or the hot pink on the left, on the right? Um, and that's, you know, some people may say the blue, some people may say the pink, you know, it's up to you. It's a subjective question. Uh, to bees, it's not subjective at all. 20 t bees prefer the regular wild type, normal, as it were, blue color uh, to the cultivar color 20 times more. So that's a big deal. That's something to think about. Uh, next. Just another example. There's a, uh, she also found that, you know, cardinal flowers attract primarily hummingbirds. Anytime you have a tubular red flower, the pollinator is probably a hummingbird. Um, and uh, there's a hybrid, you know, a hybrid of it that is bright red. It still attracts the hummingbird, but this particular hybrid uh, produce, uh, uh, the, produces 20% of the energy that the native, the wild type native produces. So it draws the hummingbirds in, but it gives them one fifth of what they would be getting from the wild type um, cardinal flower, Lobelia cardinalis. Um, again, not every cultivar causes a problem and there's just so much we don't know. Um, and it's not always easy to get the wild types, but if you can get them, uh, they're often the, just the best way to go because that's kind of the raw, uncut, natural version of it. Next. So practical advice for people who are interested in, in, in gardening for pollinators. And, you know, there's fortunately a tremendous amount of resources on, on this now as well. Uh, it's something we're very interested in in Prospect Park, but it's also, as I said, the Xerces Society, the Audubon Society, beekeeping societies. There's really a lot of great information out there now in organizations uh, to uh, give you information and walk you through it. But um, so my advice, you know, in terms of gardening for pollinators, one of the most important things you can do is use at least some native plant species. If you really want to plant for pollinators, it's, you know, go with all natives if you can. But even if you love some of the traditional ornamental non-native flowers, um, it's not all or nothing. If you plant some natives, um, that helps tremendously. So anything you do in that regard is great. The more natives you plant, the better. Plant a diversity and a variety of flower shapes, colors, and bloom times. If you can get blue, yellow, white, orange, and have thing, something that's blooming from, you know, ideally from April to November, but you know, any as long a period of time as you can, that's going to sustain the most types of pollinators for the longest period of time. It's very important. Another thing that you can do is, um, again, think about your garden. On one hand, yes, of course, it's a garden and it's not going to go be completely wild, but think of it as a habitat. And, you know, not everything is a showy flower. We talked before about grasses and sedges. Definitely plant native grasses and sedges um, that provide cover for wildlife. The seeds are food for birds. And as far as pollinators go, as I said, a lot of them are host plants for pollinators. And uh, it's very important to give them a place to lay their eggs and for their larvae to develop to become the butterflies that we love. Avoid mulch if you can. Um, and if you need to use it, don't use it on the, on the entire surface of the garden if you can. Again, the mulch is really not great for ground nesting bees. And the beauty of native plants, again, is they're adapted to the conditions. They're much less sensitive. A lot of these plants, um, you know, if you have a, a relatively dry garden in full sun, there's a lot of native plants that are adapted to just those conditions. And they will, you know, and especially if you plant other things too, like grass and things, and you have a, uh, like a more natural cover, they'll do great. Um, as I said, ho you know, plant, you think about host plants and species specific plants, things like milkweed for monarchs, things like, um, um, oat grass or um, little blue stem grass for various skipper species. Um, and remember too, it's, it's more than just food. Ideal habitat for any form of wildlife, including pollinators, will include food, water, shelter, and a place to raise their young. Water is actually very important. And I know people are concerned about mosquitoes and things like that. If you're inclined to do, if you have water that moves in any way, mosquitoes like standing water, they're not gonna really be using bubbling water or even if you just if you're in a position to do so a little dish of water and you change it out every day 
you won't get mosquitoes, but the but the wildlife will love it. You will be certain, you will be amazed what comes to drink, even at a little saucer of water that you put out for a few hours in the morning. Next. Just a couple of examples, and I'll show you some pictures of them of great garden pollinator plants. These are things we use in Prospect Park. These are things that um, hopefully you can find in one form or another, even if it, you know, sometimes as cultivars, but things that are beginning to become popular among gardeners because they're so beautiful and because they are wonderful for pollinators. Um, and this is only a small sampling. There's, there's many, many more, um, but goldenrod species, Solidago. And I'd like to mention here, um, golden, goldenrod gets a bad rap. There is a, uh, there's a longstanding kind of urban myth that goldenrod uh, causes terrible allergies. It really does not. Um, the culprit is ragweed, which blooms at the same time of year and often grows in the same locations as some of the uh, some of the goldenrod species. That's what makes you sneeze. It's not the goldenrod. Um, and, I, and we know it's not the goldenrod precisely because goldenrod pollen is big and sticky and it is spread by pollinators. It is meant to attract pollinators. Um, and it is big and, and sticky and it is too big for wind to carry under normal circumstances. So in order to be allergic to goldenrod, you really have to take the pollen and shove it up your nose. It's not blowing around in the air like ragweed is. So do not be afraid of goldenrod. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful group of plants. Aster species, Cynthia trichum, um, New England aster, frost aster, heart leaf aster. You really can't go wrong with almost any kind of native aster. Um, tremendous pollinate, beautiful plants, beautiful uh, flowers coming in different colors, usually some kind of white or blue. Um, and the pollinators um, go crazy for them. Very important fall plant for pollinators. It's a late blooming, long blooming fall plant. Milkweeds, uh, genus Asclepius. There's a lot of different milkweeds. There's butterfly milkweed, common milkweed, purple milkweed, swamp milkweed world milkweed and, and a bunch of others, all of which support monarch butterfly caterpillars and the flowers support a wide range of adult pollinators. Mountain mint, genus Pinknanthium, um, are pollinator magnets. Joe pie weeds, genus Eutrochium, and Bonisets, Eupatorium. These are also uh, spectacular magnets for pollinators. And if you have shady areas or more wooded areas, if you can find things like white wood avens, wild geranium, white wood aster, white snake root, native violets, honewort, um, these are plants we use in the park. And if you can, if you have them or can find them or they're growing naturally in your garden, um, they're great shade plants for a variety of insects. Uh, Next things are going to be. I'll show you some pictures of these plants. Yeah, you. let's let's take a look. We're running uh, towards the end of our time, so this is a great way to to to, yeah. to wrap it up. So just to some examples, just starting from from the top left and moving across. That's a species of goldenrod. I think that's showy goldenrod speciosa. The next one over is New England aster. The next one over that is a monarda. That's a bee bomb. That's a scarlet bee bomb beautiful red flower. And then the bottom, those are all milkweeds of various types. I think from left to right, it's common. I want to say common purple butterfly and maybe world. I'm not a thousand percent sure, but those are all milkweeds. Next. And then starting from the top too, that's a Joe pie weed. Next to that is a uh, short tooth mountain mint. Next to that are violets. And then on the bottom, we have a wild geranium, um, a boniset, and then the last one is white wood aster, which we, which is all over Prospect Park, and pollinators love it. And it's just a, they're beautiful, beautiful plants. And I hope people who are interested in gardening will really develop, will really uh, uh, appreciate, make an, make an effort to try to incorporate them into gardens. Absolutely, so fascinating. And and uh, these are plants that that we can find at garden centers, generally speaking sort of the the home home and this goes back to me place. making a big, well this goes back to me making a big spiel and then saying but here's the problem ah. they need this is an issue making not just natives but ideally wild types really available to the public this is something question about that yes please yeah this is something that needs to be worked on um i will say though as interest in native plants increases garden centers and things are selling native plants now. Um, I'm not, that, you know, you can absolutely find some of these things. There are 
there are retail stores, there are clubs and people, you know, trade plants and give plants. Right. So there are mechanisms uh, to find all of these things. And hopefully as this interest in this will continue to grow and it'll just become easier to acquire more and more species of native plants and, and of the wild type. Yeah, um, thank you, Howard, so much for um, your work with the Prospect Park Alliance and your continued support for our programs. Your your knowledge in this in this particular area is is is, is particularly fascinating to me. So thank you so much for for today's presentation. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Liz, John, Tim, and Andrea who talked about their own home gardening in the background there. And it just occurred to me how the the, the little source of water that. Um, that you mentioned, I might try that at home. It'd be interesting to see who does show up a fresh, fresh uh, water every day. And also it occurs to me that it would be interesting in the springtime to think about what, uh, if we were to curate a window box, um, what might that include? Maybe that's another program we could talk about and turn it into a window box club, uh, maybe get together and, uh, and figure out where we can get some of these wild types that you mentioned and some of the other plants that are, that are specifically beneficial. That would be really a lot of fun. Is there anything else you'd like to, to, to add at the very end, John? Uh, Howard, sorry, when, um, at the end of your presentation today? Or uh, have you, have you, do you feel you've uh, satisfied what you what you uh, what you came to say? Well, just wanted to thank everyone at Turnstile Tours and thank everybody watching. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this, and I hope everyone has the opportunity to uh, go into and enjoy yeah. Prospect Park, come and hopefully park. enjoy uh, take a look uh, take a look around you for uh, pollinators and other insects, and uh, you'll be amazed. They're really spectacular creatures. Yeah, and the, the idea of thinking about pollinators and insects as wildlife and as being, as, as to, to be as thrilled to see them as you might be some of the, you know, larger fauna that, that, we, that we always enjoy. Thank you so much, Howard. And I want to mention that uh, Turnstile Tours works with the Prospect Park Alliance uh, to do tours of the park. Um, Pre-COVID, we were doing these in person, and we're now hoping, and we're very close to getting ourselves organized to figuring out how we can return uh, to the park and be giving live tours sometime over the next uh, month, month plus. We hope to be uh, able to offer those. So for everyone at home, uh, please stay tuned and, and uh, get in touch with us, and we'll, we'll keep you updated on, on, on advancements in that way. Uh, we're very excited to get back in the park. It's one of our uh, favorite partnerships and one of our favorite places to take people um, in New York City. And so that's, uh, thank you, Howard, for, for your, for your uh, discussion today. And of course, we'll be welcoming Howard back to talk about Climate Week, along with Justin Bowers from, the Nat from Natural Areas Restoration. That will be on September 24th at 1230 p.m. to talk about how climate change has affected the park and other natural areas. Uh, tomorrow, I want to, to remind you about our September 11th program. Thanks again, Howard, so much. Always a pleasure to have you here. Our September 11th program talking uh, about of the boat lift on 9-11, uh, taking people off Manhattan Island in that um, time of emergency. And uh, every day is a holiday film screening on September 19th and uh, a visit with CNHO Woodworking on September 22nd. You can check out our website for all the details. Um, hope you're having a wonderful day and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much.